Influencer fraud is a pretty big topic right now in the media, and it really refers to influencers purchasing fake followers, doing some sort of gaming to either boost their follower counts or their engagement metrics, or in some cases, even their click-through numbers. Purchase of fake followers to trick the brands has become an increasingly common practice in the influencers' world. Working with this type of influencers can be disastrous for the brands, investing large amounts without any kind of impact on sales of their products or services. I think it's it's kind of just the natural evolution of our space. Um, you've seen it across all of the other forms of, of digital marketing and digital advertising. Um, you know, you look back several years and, and this same conversation was happening around click fraud. So I think with any space like ours, as it continues to mature, the expectations around the data and the validity of people who are engaging with your content starts to come under question and, and be much more focused in terms of the value of, of those interactions. And so I think it's a natural outcome of that. If you're investing thousands of dollars into an influencer marketing play, um, you have to understand that the potential uh, for fraudulent activity as far as creating a risk in terms of your investment is very low. Um, and the red flags that we see around fraudulent activity are also pretty obvious uh, from the onset. So it is very easy to not only mitigate um, sort of the, the negative effects from your campaign by just simply selecting the right influencers, uh, but it's also on us to educate ourselves around the true media impact of fraudulent or suspicious engagement. I think fraud is the wrong question to ask. I think the right question to ask, period, is does this influencer generate value? A year ago, it was very common for advertisers to buy influencer marketing plans based on follower count. Um, you know, now their savvy advertisers are focused on impressions and views. Uh, so I think as the industry evolves and matures, people are really starting to understand and dive a little bit deeper into what do these metrics really mean. We're not necessarily looking exclusively at how many followers do they have, how big is their audience. Uh, we're much more focused on the, the relevant engagement for that audience. So having a whole bunch of followers who don't interact with your content, or having a whole bunch of followers that don't act specific, interact with specifically the type of content uh, that we're looking for that influencer to post, uh, would automatically kind of move those folks out of, out of consideration. Influencers having fake followers is not this binary thing. It's really sort of a gray, muddy area. And that's because influencers don't control who follow them. Uh, so every influencer really has a certain degree of, of bots following them. You're visible, you're a big name on, let's say, Instagram. There are a lot of follow, you know, follow for follow bot programs that are running that will just follow these influencers. So it's very hard to just determine that this influencer has fraud and penalize them for it. The other thing that most people forget or don't realize is it's really a game of warfare. Um, as soon as we're able to uncover or detect a certain type of fraud, the, you know, the people or the companies engaging in that fraud find a way to then uh, address it or outsmart that system. So when you look at identifying fraud, you have to really dig a little bit deeper and look for real malicious intent um, that the influencer's taking in order, order to game their stats, right? And the reason they do that is, is obvious, is so that they can essentially charge more for a post or command more for a sponsorship. I can remember a time even a month ago where I had to let a manager know that their client actually had fake followers or it looks, you know, like they have fake followers. The important thing to know is uh, just a, a timeline of the events and what is and what is not available from a data perspective. Prior to Cambridge Analytica, it was, you know, uh, wild, wild west. Um, anybody had access to, to any number of, of different data points. Uh, across various platforms and across various accounts. Um, and some advertisers were, were using that in a, a manner that was very effective. Uh, and as we've seen, there were a lot that were doing very questionable things with that data. 
uh, for us, having access to that much broader scope of data uh, opened up a lot of potential opportunities for us uh, to look at the data in a way that would be very meaningful for our campaigns and for advertisers. As the data sets were restricted and as the platform started locking down their APIs, uh, we, we were impacted, but probably not to the extent that a lot of the other platforms were. Um, and only because we had historically taken a fairly conservative approach to the, the types of data that we were looking to access uh, and what we wanted to do with it. The changes in the APIs, being able to look at the follower level, really made it hard for individual companies to dive in deep and assess the credibility of individual followers. And so this is why I actually believe the best fraud prevention are the platforms themselves. And the focus shouldn't necessarily be on fraud because again, it's a very gray area. You should be focusing on the bottom line value, right? So are there impressions coming through? Are there story views? Are those translating into clicks? Are those clicks translating into purchases? We start by being very focused on the objectives of the advertisers. Based on those objectives and those desired outcomes, we can then use our tools and our technology to say, who are the right influencers for this campaign? During the influencer search and vetting process, we always ask for the influencer's impressions from the last 30 days, whether it's directly to the influencer themselves or to the manager who represents them. And what that shows us is how many eyes are actually seeing each post. And obviously, if we're selling something to a client and saying, by hiring these particular influencers that we found for you, you're going to get the achieved results that you're paying us for. Sometimes it happens where an influencer's impressions are very low. And we know sort of by seeing those numbers that there is a disconnect between their impressions and their follower account, which would flag that they might buy followers because otherwise more people would be seeing their posts. Yeah, I mean, it's always important to consider external factors. You know, maybe I posted with a celebrity or maybe one of my posts had a significant amount of uh, media investment behind it, so it was boosted. That's obviously going to increase the frequency of engagement on a post, uh, but may or may not uh, affect the engagement rate. So, you know, peaks and valleys in, in any of those metrics on their own don't necessarily tell you what you need to know. There's a lot of context that you need to understand as well. Um, and so those are the things that, that we wanna make sure that, that we have access to and we understand before we try to make any, any definitive judgment calls on, on fraud. I would say there's, there's not one silver bullet, right? It's really developing a system with redundancies, with checks to make sure that we're really preventing fraud as much as possible. Because data availability is at such a premium, it really does um, come down to establishing uh, reliable benchmarks. Uh, and that comes from first party data over a long enough period of time. Um, if you're truly just looking at one comment or a group of comments on one post or maybe even the last uh, handful of posts, you're again sort of doing a disservice to um, both yourself and the influencer in terms of your, of your evaluation process. So it truly does come down to looking at as much publicly available and first party data as you can get your hands on so that you can make an informed decision and have confidence in your investment. With respect to uh, again, protecting your investment, it really comes down to educating yourself and, and using all of the data that you have available to make informed decisions and finding partners in the space that are truly experts and can help you separate fact from fiction.